Brief introductions. I don't think either one of these folks needs a long introduction, and Larry does have to leave leave us early, so I want to get going. Um, I'll take a certain amount of credit personally for Larry's public career because <laughs> I'm serious. Because uh, I think the first political campaign in which he was active was my campaign when he was my economic advisor. Uh, he was a great economic advisor. That's not why I lost. <laughs> but all of you know about him, his career, uh, his deep and active involvement uh, both in the Clinton administration and the Obama administration. And uh, it's just a special treat for us to have him for you to join us. Um, these guys are both Harvard guys, as you know. And uh, Greg Mankiw uh, actually flirted with law school. You know, I spent half of my time around here warning my students about, you really want to go to law school, you want to practice law. He kind of bounced back and forth and finally decided he didn't want to be a lawyer. It was probably the best decision he's ever made. Um, and he's now the Robert M. Barron Professor of Economics at Harvard. Uh, he got his PhD at MIT. Um, he's a staff economist, as I guess Larry was, weren't you? The Council of Economic Advice in the early 80s. Um, is Pitt Romney's economic advisor and has the same role in the Romney campaign as Romney in my campaign, um, and uh, was chairman of the President's Council of Economic Advisors uh, from 2003 to 2005 during the Bush administration. Uh, because Lowry has to leave us, we're going to ask him to speak first, maybe 20, 25 minutes, uh, give you all 15 or 20 minutes to ask him some questions, and he's going to be on his way to Logan. But then, the rest of our evening will be great with you. So we're going to have a very special uh, opportunity to spend time with both of these folks. Um, this place is getting kind of crowded. I hope the fire department doesn't. <laughs> Jack, come on in, folks. Come on in. Um, but it's a real treat to have both of them addressing what I think it's fair to say is the most important single issue in this campaign. So without further ado, it's a real pleasure, personally and otherwise, to introduce Larry Summers. Larry. Thank you very much. I am uh, very glad uh, to be here with my friend Michael Dukakis, who I was very fortunate to uh, work with during his 1988 uh, presidential campaign. It was, I think, a campaign that established some principles, like the importance of infrastructure investment in uh, <coughs> United States, like the importance of reforming uh, government, whether you were liberal or whether you were conservative, making government work uh, effectively, that introduced some themes into the national debate that remain very much with us on a bipartisan basis a uh, generation later. And I can tell you that thinking back, uh, I came to the campaign, uh, perhaps I flatter myself with a reasonable amount of insight into economics, but with uh, no uh, initial insight into how that had to be done <coughs> with the imperatives of a political campaign that uh, macroeconomic theory lectures were really very unlikely to resonate. Uh, on <laughs> and while I may have been a tolerable pupil in learning that that was wrong, I will always be grateful for the patience that uh, Governor Dukakis and some of his senior political advisors uh, displayed with me in being willing to listen to what must have been unbearably naive political opinions on the way to what might have then become marginally useful uh, economic advice. It's also a great privilege uh, to be here with my long-term friend, uh, Barry Bluestone. He and I have shared uh, a summer residence on uh, the Lower Cape, uh, summer residence in the Lower Cape for many years. We have engaged in various sporting endeavors over uh, time, and Barry has in many ways 
always been uh, the progressive conscience of uh, democratic economics uh, with a focus on issues like inequality and long-term joblessness uh, before they were as fashionable to focus on uh, as they are uh, today. It was uh, my great privilege uh, that one of the first classes I ever taught as a professor of economics was one of the first graduate courses that uh, Greg Mayhew uh, ever uh, took. It was, uh, my great, uh, my great, it was my great privilege to uh, advise Greg on his uh, early research. Uh, Governor, I was early on the advice back this law school thing. And, <laughs> and it was uh, my privilege to work with Greg uh, during the time uh, that we were at the Council of Economic Advisors. So I'm glad to be here and glad to have a chance to uh, share some perspectives on the fiscal policy challenge uh, facing uh, the United States. There's one respect in which the, fiscal, the nature of the fiscal policy challenge in the United States, I believe, stands out now from what its nature has been at any previous point since the Second World War. At almost any point since the Second World War, the question was fairly clear. The question was, we've got a big budget deficit problem. What should we do about it? How should we reduce the budget deficit? And in what way should we, how fast should we reduce the budget deficit? And what should the measures for deficit reduction be? Or at other moments, it was, we've got substantial unemployment and substantial excess capacity in the economy and the government should stimulate the economy and how much stimulus should the government provide? And should it provide the stimulus by cutting taxes or by increasing spending? But it was clear that you knew what the problem was. And then the question for fiscal policy was sort of the composition of the fiscal policy and the quantity of the fiscal policy. And what stands out at this moment is that you can listen to a discussion of the deficit. And there are two major cross-cutting themes. One major cross-cutting theme is We've got unemployment above 8%. The fraction of the adult population in the United States that is working is the same as it was at the trough of the recession. We have millions of fewer people working than we did five years ago at the previous business cycle peak. Wages are, if anything, declining. Businesses have excess capacity. We have, on one argument, a major shortfall of demand. And there are many, and I'll come back to my views in a minute, who believe that increasing demand and using the government budget to increase demand has to be a central imperative at this moment. At the same time, we, are, we have accumulated debt over the last five years at an average rate of more than a trillion dollars a year. If you look at the ratio of our debt <coughs> to our GDP, it is substantially greater and on a trajectory to grow well beyond anything that was involved in the Reagan deficits. When I advised uh, Governor Dukakis in 1988, he was deeply alarmed about the buildup of debt under President Reagan. He said that something had to be done. Governor Bu uh, Vice President Bush asserted that there was no way that he would ever raise taxes. That was an effective political point for uh, Vice President Bush during the campaign because he was ultimately more patriotic than he was committed to his promises. He did the right thing and did commit to raising taxes in 1991 and that was a contributor to bringing the budget deficit 
under control. Well, our budget problems now, in terms of deficits, are much greater than we were in 1988. So the first question you have to approach when you talk about fiscal policy is are we talking about reducing the budget deficit to get the debts under control, or are we talking about increasing the budget deficit to get there to be more demand and to get jobs? That's the first question you have to ask. And I would have a clear but complicated answer. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure it's complicated. I hope it's clear. I believe that in the short run, we need to do more to put Americans back to work. So we are in a situation where the private sector is some combination of unable and unwilling to borrow and spend. Banks have limited capacity, given what they have been through, to lend funds. Households find themselves with more debts than they expected to have because of the recession. And they find that the collateral, the wealth on the other side of those debts is less than they expected. And so they want to pay back debt, not take on uh, new debt. Our exporters are doing pretty well. But the world economy has slowed, and that limits how much they can export. And so the part of our society that is in a position to provide that necessary demand is our government. That's what the Recovery Act was about. And while if you find seven economists, you can get nine estimates of what its impact is, a consensus, but by no means a universal consensus, would be that the Recovery Act contributed substantially to cushioning the blow of the recession. That, uh, in the Congressional Budget Office's estimates, about three million more people are working and would have been working if that Recovery Act had not passed. So in my judgment, the first imperative is this is no time to take demand out of the economy. It would be madness if we went over the so-called fiscal cliff and we started to, to cut back spending on a massive scale on January 1st. It would be madness if we raised taxes and imposed the largest tax increase in American history at a time when households uh, were struggling. It would be madness if we repealed the payroll tax cut that gives workers an extra incentive to work and businesses an extra incentive uh, to uh, hire workers. So step one, wrong time for a lurch to austerity. And unless Congress acts in November or December, we will have a lurch to austerity on January. Step two, I think there are necessary and appropriate public investments that are not being made and that should be made that would have the effect of both increasing the level of demand in the economy and pushing it forward and would leave us better prepared for the challenges of the remainder of this century. How many of you have been to Kennedy Airport? How many of you are proud of Kennedy Airport as a gateway to the greatest city in the greatest country on Earth? And I would ask you, at a moment when the federal government can borrow money for 30 years in a currency we print at an interest rate below 3% at a moment when construction unemployment is in excess of 15%. Could there be a better time to fix Kennedy Airport? And Kennedy Airport is not an isolated example. When I was Treasury Secretary, I used to, because I thought it was an important principle, every time I visited an American city, I would go visit a public school. 
and I would meet with kids and talk about uh, the importance of uh, education. And I'll never forget one day in Oakland, I gave my speech about the importance of education, and the kids were you know, about as attentive as you'd expect them to be to an adult player at a time. But, they, <laughs> but it was okay. And this young teacher took me aside and said, uh, Mr. Secretary, that was a good speech. But how can the kids take you seriously about education being the most important thing when the paint is chipping off the walls of this school? And when this school is so over capacity that the first lunch period starts at 945. I didn't have an answer to that question. But I'll tell you this, the infrastructure in 30,000 schools in the United States has been rated as substandard. Can it make any sense that right now, when we are full, when education is the civil rights issue of our time? The tens of thousands of teachers are being laid off. I don't think so. I actually personally am much closer to Rahm Emanuel's views. I think there should be merit pay for teachers. I think evaluating teachers on the basis of their students' performance is a good idea. So I'm not on the straight down some union line. But do we need more teachers who are more qualified? more aggressively recruited in the United States right now? Or do we need to be laying off teachers indiscriminately in the United States right now? I think that's a question that's got a pretty obvious answer. So I think there are important investments, I just gave you two examples, that the government can and should be making. And I think right now, when the private sector is unable or unwilling to borrow, the government should borrow to finance those investments. In fact, there's even an argument, it's, it's an argument that most, unlike some of what I've said, this is an argument that I, a collaborator, have put forward, and I believe it, but I wouldn't want to tell you that most economists yet subscribe to it. But if you think about it, if by spending a dollar, you generate an extra dollar fifty of GDP, that dollar fifty of GDP means you've got a bigger tax base, That'll bring in about 50 cents. But because the economy is stronger, there's more investment, there's more workers who are gaining work experience, companies are in a greater position to do R&D, the economy is going to be larger down the road as well. And if the economy is only 15 cents larger down the road because of that extra dollar fifty, that's another nickel a year that the government's going to collect because of the investment. And pretty soon, we actually end up with a lower debt to GDP ratio than we would have if we had not made uh, the investment. So I think in the very special circumstances that we're in right now, a deeply depressed, stuck economy with a zero interest rate that limits what the Federal Reserve can do to expand the economy, I think there's a case for making critical public investments. I think there's also a case for maintaining the tax cuts that we've, that we've had for middle income families, both for workers and the tax cuts that they've become accustomed to over the last 10 years. Those families spend somewhere between 95 and 99% of their incomes. So almost all of that money is injected right back into the economy. Now there's a place where there's a difference in perspective. It's an absolutely central issue in the political campaign. I think from an economic point of view it's a significant issue, but not as significant as the importance of more, uh, in that more investment, which is what about the taxes on those making more than $250,000? those who are in the top 1% of the economy. I think, given the magnitude of the debts that we are accumulating, given that that's a group in our population that saves a substantial part of every dollar 
than it receives. Given that the economy grew pretty well when President Eisenhower was president and the top tax rate was 90%, grew pretty well when President um, Kennedy was president and the top tax rate was 70%, grew pretty well for the first six years of President Reagan's term when the top tax rate was 50%, grew pretty well for the last six years of the President Clinton's term when the top tax rate was 39%, I don't think we're going to do any real damage by raising that tax rate back from 35 to 39 percent. I don't think that when um, the next Mark Zuckerberg is thinking about starting his company and thinking that he's going to create the next Facebook, I don't think he's sitting there thinking much about whether he's going to get to keep 70 percent of it or whether he's going to get to keep 65 percent of it. I just don't think that's where his thinking is going to go. But that's a judgment. And others, and I suspect uh, Greg Mankiw, would disagree on that point about high income, about those with high income. But I would hope a substantial volume of economists would agree that for the near term, we need to make some critical public investments that will increase demand, and that we shouldn't engage in large tax increases. And any tax increases we do engage in should be confined to those with high incomes. Now here's the tough part. The tough part is, let's assume, and it's a big assumption and it's not one that I would take for granted except for the purpose of continuing the discussion. Let's assume that we successfully achieve an economic recovery and that four years from now the economy is back somewhere close to a normal employment level, somewhere with unemployment uh, in the fives with many more people working than were working in 2008. The government will, at that point, be taxing substantially less than it will be spending. And it won't be possible to simply grow our way out of it because we'll have returned to the economy's potential uh, level of uh, growth. Uh, this is all very incestuous. A uh, student who uh, Greg and I both advised on his uh, on his graduate uh, thesis at Harvard, Doug Elmendorf, is the director of the Congressional Budget Office. He. Uh, person in charge of sort of keeping score on all of this uh, budget stuff. And he can make it as complicated and go into as much detail uh, as uh, you like. But he said, look, uh, he basically, when he came and made a presentation about this, said it in as simple and as clear a way as I've ever heard it said. You can work very hard to reduce defense spending but there are limits to what's going to be responsible to do in the way of reducing defense spending. And we're already assuming that we're out of Iraq. We're already assuming that we're out of Afghanistan. We're already, a lot of what can be done, we're already assuming in the current uh, projection. We can work very hard to reduce the general run of what the government does, so-called discretionary spending, discretionary not because we really have a choice about whether to have the national parks, but because it's budgeted separately uh, each year. But we're already planning to have that kind of spending be the lowest level of spending relative to the size of the economy since President Eisenhower uh, was uh, <coughs> president. So basically, and we got a lot of headwinds. We've got more people over 65 relative to the whole population than we used to. Interest rates aren't always going to be zero, and our debt's larger than uh, it used to be. And the federal government pays for things, uh, the private sector pays for things like digital television sets, and the federal government pays for things like health and education. And guess what? The price of health and education goes up a lot faster than the price of high-definition TVs 
which actually goes down. So they're big headwinds. Here's what he basically says. He says that if you want to get the federal budget, not into balance, but into a place that is sustainable, into a place where your debts aren't exploding relative to your incomes. Here's the choice. You can cut all the remaining federal spending, mostly health care and social security, by 25%, all of it, tomorrow. Or you can raise taxes, all of them, by one-sixth. Or you can do some combination of the two. Now, that's not an attractive choice. None of it is attractive. My view is that you need to uh, do some combination of the two. The so-called Simpson-Bowles Commission, which many of you have heard about, produced a plan. The goal was to get bipartisan support. In fact, there were Senate Democrats who supported the plan. There were Senate Republicans who supported the plan. There were House Democrats who supported the plan. There were no House Republicans uh, who supported the plan. And Paul Ryan led the House Republicans in opposing it. When that outcome came out, President Obama had a choice. I remember sitting with him when he made the choice. One view was he could have endorsed the plan. And in some ways, that would have been quite good politics. He would have shown that he was really trying to solve the problem and that the House Republicans were the ones who were blocking the solution. On the other hand, the constituency that needed to be brought along was the House Republicans. And the one thing that would be the kiss of death would be President Obama's endorsement. Because they, politically, couldn't get behind anything that he had advocated. And so he made a decision to <coughs> welcome and value the plan, but not to explicitly endorse it, and try to harvest the good ideas from the commission. And I think two very important good ideas came out of that commission. One was a, a recognition on the part of Democrats, and more of a recognition than there had been before, that the so-called entitlement programs, Medicare and Social Security, needed to uh, be reformed and needed to be scaled, needed to have adjustments made to their face. The other was a recognition on the Republican side that tax expenditures were expenditures. That is, when you gave a special credit or a subsidy through the tax system, by, for example, letting me deduct my mortgage interest, that was just like giving me a subsidy on my interest payments. And so in many ways, it was just like an expenditure. And Republicans, even though they said they were against tax increases, <coughs> bought into the idea that reducing a tax expenditure reducing a subsidy in the tax code, which would raise more tax revenues, was an expenditure reduction. So those are two important ideas that it seems to me need to be harvested. Now look, I think we need to operate in a balanced way. I think we need to both address revenues and we need to address entitlements. One of the differences between people like Greg and me, and it's less a difference that we have as professional economists than a difference that we have as citizens about our values is that I would rather see more increases in taxes, particularly on affluent Americans, and more preservation of the kind of basic protections for those with lower incomes that Social Security and Medicaid and Medicare provide. And he would be, I think it's fair to say, I suspect, it's, I suspect he will tell you, more inclined to feel that 
if you hold taxes down, you'll expand the size of the pie faster, and that will be better for everybody. And that's a values judgment. And that's what we need to have a president and a congress, whoever wins the election, work out. Where it does seem to me that people go off base <coughs> is when they suggest that this be treated in terms of absolutes, that it can all be done on the expenditure side, or that it can all be done, uh, or should all be done on the tax side. And it seems to me where they go a little beyond the fringe is when they suggest that now is a moment when we can propose, when any, anyone who suggests now that we can propose a massive permanent expenditure that will continue after the economy recovers without proposing a way of paying for it, I think that would be wildly irresponsible, frankly. And I think anyone who suggests that it's possible to cut taxes and tax rates in a massive way without suggesting how it's going to be uh, paid for, I think is also on fairly shaky ground. Now, you know, to my reading, but I'm on one side of the political aisle, uh, President Obama has, though he's very much concerned uh, with questions of fairness and equity, has not made proposals for permanent spending increases uh, without proposing for how they would be uh, paid for. Whatever you say about Obamacare, um, the Congressional Budget Office scores it as helping the position of the Treasury in the fullness of the proposal. Governor Romney appears to be in a somewhat different place. He's talked about cutting all tax rates by 20% and has spoken only in very general terms, which analysts have had some trouble fleshing in about closing loopholes and uh, closing uh, subsidies. So I think there's some difference there apart from uh, the values difference. But to summarize, um, I would hope we can all agree that we don't need to go over the fiscal cliff. And I think we can probably all agree on that. I would think that many would agree that an absolutely crucial priority is making sure that the economy has demand and is in a position to grow for the next several years. And I would argue very strongly that high return areas like preserving teachers' jobs and fixing outdated infrastructure should be part of maintaining that demand along with preserving tax cuts for people in the middle class. And for the medium term, we need to make plans in order to give confidence that shows that our nation's finances are sustainable. I believe the right way to do that is both to address the question of entitlements and tax revenues. I think that needs to be a matter on which there is compromise because much of it involves questions of values where values differ. Mine are more on the side of supporting social insurance and being willing to live with <coughs> less tax cutting and more revenues. Others less focused on fairness relative to growth probably have somewhat different views. Thank you very much.